here. Neha, thanks again for coming back. You know, we've loved all of our other sessions with you, and I think people are extremely excited to learn about portraiture today. Um, I know that's one of your main mediums, so it's going to be awesome to kind of learn more about it through your artistry. Um, everyone, we are recording, so we'll get this up on our YouTube in about a week or so. Um, you can go ahead and send questions in the chat. Both Mia and I will keep an eye on it throughout. And of course, you know, you're welcome to raise your hand, unmute, just ask questions as they pop up. Um, Mia will be doing a little bit of drawing in person um, on his second screen, as well as sharing slides. So we'll toggle back and forth um, obviously, you know, we're in a virtual space, so we do the best we can so you can see. I just want to remind everyone, you can um, pin one of his screens for yourself if one view is easier for you or better for you. I'm going to go ahead and, and just try to flow with what I think works best. Um, but, you know, you can always change those settings for yourself and you can message me if you're having any trouble there. All right. Thanks, Mihan. I'm going to let you take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, thank you, Anna, for uh, welcoming me back. Um, it's exciting. We're going to do portraiture for this last uh, workshop, and I'm going to try to keep the slides to minimum and primarily try to focus on some demos. And I have, uh, we're going to do two demos, but I'll show you a couple of different approaches to how you can do portraiture yourself. These are easy to follow steps, and they have, they're tried and true. So let me grab the slides here. Um, and, you know, um, just a little bit about myself. My name is Miha Sarani. I was born in Ljubljana in uh, Slovenia, and I'm a visual artist and an art historian. And I've graduated from University of Washington with both my uh, bachelor's and my master's degree. So today we're going to be looking at um, portraiture, and it's one of the oldest sort of subject matters around. Um, you know, it's millennia old and probably since the first cave person did representation of something on a wall, it would include one form of likeness. Uh, so historically, if you go really far back, that there are certain rules within portraiture and aesthetically, it has clearly changed quite radically. And we go from representation of likeness on coins, which was often reserved for emperors or uh, kings and queens and different sort of leaders, maybe dukes, which still today, you know, you see, uh, we have it on the quarter in England. They have they have the the uh, profile of the queen, and then it eventually begins to kind of trickle down to more common, if you will, uh, people. But again, as I said, there's certain rules. So a side portrait would be reserved for royalty or leadership, and a full frontal would often be reserved for um, divinity, you know, God. Um, and then Renaissance comes around and pr proportions, perspective, stuff like that comes in. So likeness becomes more significant. And it really becomes a, um, a skill of an artist to try to de depict that likeness as close to as possible. So we also, the mediums change and we go from egg tempera, which would be this medium. It's much chalkier, it's opaque. It's not transparent, so it's very hard to layer. Uh, and for example, or layer, I shouldn't say it's hard to layer. It's hard to create uh, transparent uh, layers. But then oil comes in and you know these beautiful passages where you could really articulate uh, the, the turns of the face and the highlights and the shadows becomes really the norm. It becomes the, the golden standard. And of course, by the time we get to Da Vinci, he really pushes that notion of chiaroscuro um, or modeling with light and dark that we have talked in some of our previous uh, workshops um, to, to an extreme. And really, by the time we get to, to Baroque and somebody like Caravaggio, I mean, just look at how extraordinary this is rendered and really feels like that it has a sense of volume. It has a sense of density. You know, these aren't just sort of masks floating in the air, you really feel that there's density, there's bone, there's tissue below these surfaces. Uh, and yet, look at the gorgeous variety of tone that you can find. Uh, of course, this is also a very controversial uh, portrait, um, but artists begin to push that, uh, that what can be done uh, with portraiture. And pretty soon, it sort of begins to go beyond just likeness, right? Just beyond capturing 
uh, beyond the fidelity to the subject matter. So by the time we get to the middle of the 19th century, there's an invention that really kind of causes a bit of a, uh, you know, crisis of consciousness, if you will, in, in painting, and that's photography, because photography can really capture likeness much better and with greater speed uh, than painting. So artists now try to add something else, something that uh, photography couldn't, which is feeling, right? You can add your own interpretation either about the subject matter or try to project into the subject something that the artist may feel about it. So you can see, look at how radically different this Gauguin looks compared to, you know, uh, this Antonella de Messina's portrait. Uh, because he's no longer trying to capture just likeness. It's not about the fidelity to the subject matter. It's, it's other aspects of it. So the further we move along that line of art history to our present time, the more radically outside of the norm these portraits step. So we get to the early 20th century and sort of all bets are off. Proportions are off the, the space itself. You can see how um, the, the, the skin tones certainly don't feel like any skin tone you've ever seen. So this fauvism would really kind of lean more up into the feeling about the subject, feeling about the atmosphere and almost more expressionistic than uh, just capturing the likeness. Look at the size of her hands. And so artists begin to become more radical um, in terms of their portraiture. And so we look at this beautiful Frank Auerbach. Look at how sculptural this is. This, you almost can't tell if this is a painting or a sculpture, is it a relief or is just a ton of paint accrued to that surface. We got Andy Warhol and his treatment of the uh, iconography or breaking it. Philip Guston, a portrait of the head from the back. How extraordinary is that? We got a Basquiat and self-portrait, uh, that untrained approach to art making, uh, contemporary master Luke Twimmons, uh, and so, so on and so forth. Uh, and we come into present time where, you know, likeness goes beyond, as I said, just simple fidelity to the subject matter. Artists are trying to express other elements within their work. And that's where we are gonna pick up today. So what I'm gonna show you is a couple of different approaches. And the we are going to use grid and line, which is sort of, if you could put it in the time period, it would be kind of the early Renaissance period. Then the grid and color, which would sort of be the second half of Renaissance, late Renaissance, and then going into Baroque and Neoclassicism. Then we're gonna do some blocking, uh, blocking with shapes and values, which would be kind of uh, roman Romanticism to like an early modern period. And then the last we're going to look at is going to be abstraction experimentation, which would be a very contemporary uh, approach to portraiture. So a couple of examples here. Um, when we get to the, the first one, which is grid, this one is the, 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 the most precise way to capture uh, likeness or portraiture. So here's a couple of examples. And the reason artists would use a grid is because you can transfer the information regardless of how large your surface is. What that means is that you could take a very small photograph or a sketch or whatever, and turn it into a very big, uh, on a very big surface. For example, these two portraits began as two by three inch sketches. And these final paintings are seven by eight feet tall. So they were done through the use of a grid. First example we're gonna to use today is a portrait of Vito Acconci, which was, a, was a, um, a conceptual artist, if you will. So the thing to remember is that you can see that the original source, the photo is rectangular, but we are gonna be using square. So you want to crop your image to accommodate the ratio of what your surface is. In my case, uh, if you can tell, is that the square that I'm using on, on, on the second screen is square, not rectangular. So that is to accommodate the, uh, 
the source itself, right? Then the second thing you would do is you would actually create a grid. Now, in an old, olden days of <laughs> what you would do is you would print up the, the image and just simply use a ruler to, you know, uh, create a um, grid that is consistent. And then you can, you create the exact same grid on your surface. That is the key. You want to make sure that the number, the, the grid number matches between the source and your surface. So um, in this case, we are using a, a, a simple 16 uh, spot grid. And the key is also one thing I forgot to mention is the higher number of squares, more precise your information is going to be. So if you keep that in mind, if you want to create a portrait that is truly, you know, almost photorealistic, you would want to use a higher number grid because the information of each square is reduced and therefore you can be more precise in what you do. But we're not going to be that precise today because it would simply sit, take too long. So we're going to simply be using this square. Now, this is the key here. You want to flip that grid upside down. You, you are going to be working on that grid upside down, um, not uh, looking at the image. And that is really the most important aspect because what we are trying desperately to do is not look at an image and therefore when we draw the eye, think in our, in our minds, oh, we're drawing an eye. We're gonna try to be thinking in abstract terms and translate each square as an abstract shape. Now, we have the grid, we've turned the image upside down or at least our source. And now we start and only focus on the grid at hand or the square at hand. So. We will be working this way, um, uh, left to right, top to bottom. So we start with this square. We have nothing. Good. We can just move on to the next square. Uh huh. We get to the first square that has information in it. Now, my suggestion is you, you squint to where the information gets much looser and you're going to kind of see it blurrier. And now just look at the negative space, which is the space that's not occupying, uh, that's not the object itself. In this case, it's just the black of the page. So I kind of did this earlier to show it to you. And you can see how I'm simplifying with the red line. And so, you know, you can think of it like this is a tree trunk and these are some branches coming out. So in my demo here, I am going to look and I see I'm focusing on the square. I can see right away that it's slightly short of a halfway mark. So I'm not going to go at half. I'm going to go a little bit in. Then it's a bit of an, uh, a bit of an angle as it slopes down. I pull that down. I could add, again, a halfway mark would be right there. But slightly above it, there's this curve. I employ that curve. And then if I want even more information, I can certainly add this other swell that goes from the bottom, which is exactly at a halfway mark, slightly short of a halfway on a right hand side. And what we get basically something like this. Right. So I'm going to uh, stop the screen so you can see on my other screen what I've done this is basically the information that we were focusing in there, but abstracted, simplified, right? So now we can, yeah, right there. So um, if I now share the screen, hopefully Anna can help me with this, you will be able to tell the difference between the screen scene uh, and what I'm translating. Now we move on to the next um, square, which brings us to this. Okay, we can now again look at the information we have and say let's focus on the on the on the black shape and it kind of looks like inverted, uh, you know, triangle. So 
we will pull that down to there. We'll put this up. Boom, we got that. Now, again, we have a swell right here or a, a quarter of a, a circle. We can connect that. Look at that beautiful shape right there. We'll keep it nice and negative. Add that in. Okay, now I can fill this in. That is um, all dark right there. The same thing, I'm adding it to the one from before. I forgot to fill in. Okay, great. We can now move on to the next square. Anything here? Nothing. Let's leave it blank. Row two. Okay, there's a little bit of a, a little, it looks like a really weird looking T right there. So let's keep that in our- uh, Can you just sh shift your notebook over? Oh, just sure. A tiny little bit. There yeah. Oh, perfect. So now we get here and let's outline that little T. Okay, we got that. There's a little bit of info here, but I, I wouldn't lose any sleep over that. It's not super significant, I think. Um, I could be wrong. You can always fill that in later. Okay, so we got that. We'll go to the next. Aha, uh -huh. this one has quite a bit of information. So let's, let's break it down nice and simple. I would say in your eye, in your mind's eye, you can connect this corner with this corner and you, it's gonna create this kind of diagonal uh, cut. And so if you have that diagonal cut, it kind of gives you the, the general direction of where your lines in this little square are going. So again, from here to here, from right, it kind of looks like this, right? That's our swell, our angle. The rest is all just um, negative space. So we use that negative space. Now, look at this. Here, there's a lot of really great abstract objects that we can pretend are there. Look at this cool little pyramid or, or triangle right here. I certainly add that. Does it go past the halfway mark? No, it falls slightly short. So we got that. Then look at this cool uh, alien looking dark shadow. It looks like an alien riding a, a scooter from the back. Okay, I draw that. Alien riding a scooter from the back. How high does it go? Halfway mark? No, slightly short. So again, we go to right about there. Then we have this beautiful inverted kind of, uh, actually it looks like a really cool Batman sign. So let's add that Batman sign. All right. And then the last piece of information right here we need is this little dark dip just below the, the, the top line. So let's add that for good measure. Okay, still keeping it nice and abstract. And I, and I like that a lot. So let's keep on moving. Next square, boom. All right, let's start with a negative space here, which is easier to, to, to capture. So squint and look at where is the darkest shape. It's, like, it's about a third of the square at the bottom edge. So indicate that. It's a little bit more than third at a top line. So indicate that. Now, there's a little bit of a white highlight right there, or light highlight, I should say. So let's include that. But now this angle, basically we can just draw the line between the two indents that we made. And it should look something close to like this. All right, we can darken out the negative space because we don't need that information. And now we can connect this little swell which will give us something like that, okay? Let's see, what else do we have? We certainly would want to indicate this dark little intrusion right there. Boom, let's add that. And once more, we have a cool looking uh, pyramid of Giza in the distance through a fog. Let's do that. Okay, now, we have a little bit of a dark triangle at about a third up, right? If you imagine that you're dividing this edge into thirds, I would say to about third up, there should be a dark triangle. And then once more, this 
uh, diagonal that doesn't really connect to anything. It just sort of, sort of tapers out. All right, we got that information. Now let's go to the next corner. Anything here? Man, really nothing of too much interest. I mean, there's a, you could indicate that looks like a bird flying in a distance. So if you really feel like that's gonna help you define the image, you can mark that into your square. I'll do it just uh, so we can see what it looks like. All right, now we move on to the next. Uh, you can probably add this little light fracture uh, right there just enough to kind of add a bit of a variety so it's all not all just dark squares everywhere all right we're adding that boom okay let's move on to the next one aha uh -huh. okay this one once more has much more information to cover so let's break it down by first thinking abstract shapes beautiful beautiful sliver right here of negative space that really helps us define this entire square. So I would certainly, the first thing I would do is I would mark that out, as you can see on, on, on the demo, um, because it really kind of helps me articulate. And I see that it's really, if you squint, dark, dark, and then this little um, horseshoe shape right here. So the horseshoe shape, I indicate, and then right here, it'd be in a, oh, it's always helpful to just kind of imagine where the halfway edge would break within this square. And I can see halfway would go down here, which is almost where the top of this um, inverted kind of half sphere goes. And then a large turn on its side C shadow falls looking something like this. Now, you could also add this little accent at the top, making it like that. Okay, move on to the next square. All right, we have uh, next to it, again, I'll be starting by defining this small little square with a uh, negative space, which now I will fill in quickly giving me something like this right now what am i focusing on is i'm repeating the same kind of process that i just did where's the halfway line right there going down okay what meets it at the half is this little cool shadow place uh, thing and then just within this half that's left right here you can see this um once more a uh, half circle I mark that and then below it, it almost looks like a, an egg uh, in, in, in a bed of a, a bird, um, with a little bird's nest, you know, just the tip of an egg from the bird's nest. Okay, I add that, boom, we got that. And then on top, cap it with this little lid, boom. All right, we got that. Next square, really nothing. So. I'm just gonna mark it out. Okay, next square, not much. All right, we can mark this out too. This is uh, this is easy. Okay, next. Okay, here, this time we're gonna only draw out the pot, the, not the negative, but the, the, the light section. So slightly in from the edge, and then curve to about half, something like that. And then the rest is all dark. Boom. Next, repeat the process. Again, I'm focusing on the light shape against the darkness. So slightly below the halfway mark, I begin my, my, my trajectory and then I, it curves upwards or in this case downwards and then pass the halfway mark, actually pass a third way mark, almost to a quarter mark, looking something like this. Fill that in. 
and I proceed to the last square. Anything in there? Nothing again. Now, if I feel that I have got garnered all the information that I need for each one of the squares, and only then I turn it around. Now, what I get is something like this. So now what I can do is I can go in and revisit the information that I think might need either readjusting or maybe uh, shifting it a little bit because it's, you know, if, if you kind of take your time, we, you can really get it as close to the original as possible. Um, and what I would suggest at this point is, um, you know, revi revisit the areas that might need that. And you can see, okay, the reason why this looks a little different is because, for example, right here in the nose, we have indicated, we haven't indicated that nostril and then where the shadow falls. So that would bring it up. This would bring it up. And then we would also revisit this corner and then connect that. Okay. Um, also, I was uh, the, the mouth needs fixing, but that's the first way of how um, you can um, create a portrait by using a grid. The reason it's, it's really helpful to use this process is A, to get as close to the original as possible. B, by turning this, uh, this portrait upside down, you really will have the opportunity to, have, to emotionally detach yourself from the subject matter. So for example, when I work on portraits of the people that actually are emotionally significant to me, it's often uh, very difficult to, to leave your opinion as you're developing this at the door. You, you, by the time you get to the eye, you're already thinking, let's say, you're, let's say I'm drawing, drawing a portrait of my wife. And by the time I get to the eye, I'm gonna be like, oh my God, it doesn't look like Tom at all. So then I put out the second eye and I'm like, oh, now it doesn't look like, any, like her at all. And I begin go back revisiting the first, which causes the second one to be out of whack. And you can continue going and, you know, into infinity. But by doing it upside down, it really prevents you from seeing that person themselves because you're focusing rather on these negative shapes, on abstract objects. And once you turn it, it's easier to look at it objectively and be like, oh, okay, I just need to do this and this and this and this and this. Now, having mastered the grid, you can now do grid with color, which means that this is when now you're incorporating also the relationship of the color variation. Now, so you can see there's an, old, on the, uh, an older example here where the portrait was created with the grid and then it was through the layering of colors that ultimately uh, give you that sense of articulation, right? So because it would take too long, I actually pre-recorded uh, uh, this part and I'll, sh and I'll just play the video for you which is basically the grid, which we had just done, but with the addition of color. So it would look something like this. So you fill in, you first outline all the shapes as we did, and now you begin layering the colors. The key is never to use the same color because there should be variety, right? So the best thing to do is just mix your own skin tones. And then you begin to basically sculpt with those colors until it sort of looks like, <laughs> hopefully, the person that you're trying to uh, capture. Then we get to the portraiture that's done with simple blocking shapes and values. This is where you are focusing on a certain element, but you're not necessarily using the grid for the precision, right? So all of these examples were just done kind of like how we did our first with grid, but by capturing the negative space shapes and sort of saying, okay, well, I'm gonna, if I just start with the mustache, that gives me a good enough anchor 
for the other reference points to follow. But I'm not that worried about making sure the proportions are exactly correct. So let's do uh, an example on that. So we're going to use this portrait of um, or photo portrait of Langston Hughes. And once more, the first thing I would do is I would be looking at the source material and surface. In this case, the source material is rectangular, but I want to use a square surface. So I would have to crop that image. Now, the way this is done the quickest now is by simply uh, kind of by squinting, you can almost get rid of the color. We're not really interested in color. So we are interested in dark and light shapes. And you can see that by turning it into black and white, it really just gives you um, the, the values are easier to determine, right? You don't get lost on this red background because now it actually becomes just part of the gray spectrum. Okay, we have that. The, the first thing you could do is simply divide the space diagonally because you can see that diagonal line. It runs from right here, white, and then the dark background comes up to here and it almost picks up again once here to continue that space, right? So we have a diagonal line, which helps us establish our sort of core point around which everything else will kind of revolve. There's a second you could begin is by just looking at this wide shape of a shirt and say, oh yeah, it goes up, it comes down, it goes back up, it comes down again. That could be a second reference point. The, you could simply start with a head and say, oh, well, it looks like straight line, straight line. And, and then we have this weird kind of trapezoid shape that helps us get the core of that image. Altogether, it looks like this. And yet this is actually really how then by adding a few more lines, you get to this, right? So we would, uh, let's, let's look at it again in real time. Yeah, we have, we could start with that sharp diagonal. So I'll start with that. It gives me this, right? And if I'm using that sharp diagonal, it also helps me because that separation between the white plane and the dark plane right here is also where the shirt goes up to right there. We come down under an angle, which is the, at the angle of the triangle on this side and this side, it's almost the same. So I come down, go back up for a split second, right? I'm not going to worry about the edges and round corners right now. I'll fix those later. Then one more angle like that, and now a sharp angle down. You could add this interesting looking, uh, almost like a snake. That's our dark line right there. Okay. Now, look, look at all the information we already have here. Right. So let's go back to this point of reference because it's just easier to capture. So you can do a swoop for the air. Remember, it's all at this point, it's not so much about the precision, right? We're not going for that photorealistic kind of um, sensation like we were with the other two. If we wanted that, we would have simply employed the grid, which is not what we're doing now. So now we're going more for kind of, uh, you know, more modern um, approach. Now, these shapes have an interesting kind of incline right there. We follow that. And it's almost like out, in. And we follow that line. We get to right there, drop down. Right now, we can fill in this uh, straight line with a bit of a dip in the middle, which looks something like this. Which that edge now connects down here, right? So it's e now we just kind of with a bit of a swell follow to the point that we had outlined earlier, which was down here by where the tie is.
And let's see. You got that. Now you want to articulate the space even more. You can certainly are welcome to add that dark shadow right there, which will really help you articulate and kind of sculpt this area, right? And now look at all the stuff that we can add to it by simply using all the, the dark areas that create this really wonderful abstract shapes. So we've already added across the line that's gonna, that is the eyebrows, but we're not thinking in, in features yet. We've got that shadow, which is right there, which connects us. Look at this, it looks like a, like a Freddy Krueger hand right there. Okay, we're gonna use a Freddy Krueger hand, that works. Brings us here, we got that. Right here, whatever shape, in your mind's eye works, interpret that. Okay, now we are on the same line. You just, we're cutting across to the, this right-hand side of the, of the, of the oval. We're not being too precious with our lines. Just move those lines around, have fun with it because we can always readjust them. Now it's, it's helpful at this point to sort of find ref, uh, reference points or um, like anchor points. So for example, from the center of where your eye blob shape is, which is that, if you go straight down it brings you to the corner of where his mouth lies, right? Which is right here. So if I were to just press down a dot, it would be like right around here. We have that and, okay, so we have the, the line, the, the axis on which it lies, but what's the cross axis to it? it? Should be roughly where the shirt connects or the, where the collar and the, the shirt connect. So about right, on my drawing, it's see, I can see that my proportions are off, but that's what makes it exciting because it's more kind of modern. Okay, we'll put it right there. Triangular shape, up, down, okay. We got that shape, okay. We got that shape, all right. Now we can use the dark shadow right there to, to, to connect from one sh uh, side of the triangle to the other side of the triangle. But instead of going straight, we're going to bow it out a little bit. And at this point, what it's sometimes um, helpful to do is not let the line or the, the mark you're making just go straight, but kind of let that pen, whatever your tool is, slightly wander in your hand. It will give you this much more organic uh, line that moves moves about. All right, we have those shadows. Let's uh, indicate this shadow up here, which would be this shadow. All right, we got this uh, shadow where the nostril falls. We add that, and same on the other side. And again, use those reference points of, of the triangle or these imaginary shapes for yourself as a points of reference. Get that up, all right. So there's, there's many directions you can take this in. You can re-correct the proportions um, if you're going for more sort of expressionistic image, you can keep it where it is. Um, we can add more shadows. Remember, the more information you add to this image, the more defined this image will become. The, the, the less you add, the more kind of um, suggested it is. And for example, I'm going to use a little bit of white out right here to take care of that line because it's, uh, I, I don't care for it. So let's fix it right here as well. Let's fix it right up here as well. Okay, we got that information now. As I said, you can, you can uh, be experimental, be bold, be brave with this. Uh, 
let's how about we use a little bit of uh, red wine here to just to add a bit of a variety, a little bit of a distinct, uh, we use this as the shadows. The shadows are um, the midtones better. All right, we put that. And you see what happens now, it begins to sort of articulate. It, it's, giving, it, it's giving the face a little more volume, a little more three-dimensionality. It's not as flat as it was when it was just all white um, paper with dark outline. So um, you can use watercolor. I mean, really, the, the sky is your limit. Um, and with the summer just around the corner, or actually it's already here, maybe you got some vacation coming up. Just find images that you like, uh, that excite you, uh, and do studies, do some uh, exercises, and then move maybe to loved ones. The portraiture of the friends and family is absolutely the hardest, um, because we always, as I said earlier, add that element of um, you know emotional connection to the subject matter, and so we never really kind of get to see them for who and what they they really are. We, we project what we think they are, uh, which is uh, why a lot of artists use self-portraiture because um, it's, you know, the model is always there and uh, you don't worry about offending them. Uh, you don't have to worry about your subject being offended if they don't look like they should because you're the subject. Okay, now the last approach is just abstract experimentation. This is really, really anything can go here. So you can truly exaggerate the, the parts of the features. You can flatten the colors. Uh, you can take it into any direction you want to take it. Uh, and you know the colors don't have to be local colors. They can be completely made up colors that uh, just work together or are exciting to look at. Um, you know, and you can actually experiment with medium. This is a, a commercial silver paint background. So the, depending on how you look at this painting, it really makes the subject uh, interact with that background in a very kind of interesting way. Uh, as I said, you could take even uh, images of the, your favorite, um, you know, celebrities or, or or the politicians you don't like. Those are actually really good to do as well uh, because there's less emotional attachment. And, you know, just add a little bit of color, get experimental. Uh, we'll do another one today. We've got, well, actually we've got 15 minutes left. Let's see really quick what we can do with this uh, portrait of one of my absolutely favorite artists. This is uh, Katie Korvitz. So that page is still drying. So let's uh, do uh, something on the smaller quicker one. All right. How about a trade with this? And we'll do another quick drawing and then we will uh, make sure we leave a little bit of time for if there are questions or anything like that. So there's really no format when it comes to the experimentation abstraction. You can you can begin by using a grid. You can begin by perhaps uh, simply, you know, there may, might be an element that's interesting to you. Maybe, maybe it's her eyes and you wanna focus on that and say, okay, let's uh, use this. Okay, let's say the eyes. Let's begin here. And then you can even begin playing around and say, okay, how about I add now with a red mark? I apologize for the dog. Another um, great exercise or, or sort of a way to loosen up your work at this stage is, you know, if you give yourself a little bit of chance, uh, I'm a great believer in chance. It provides some really wonderful elements that you can't control. 
So what I like to do sometimes is switch my hand because I really can't do anything with my left hand. So by using my left hand, it really creates these marks that I can't control. And yet there could be some really wonderful uh, things happening if I just kind of, it gives you very kind of looseness to write something that otherwise it's really hard to achieve. So, I mean, I'm already liking this. This could go in a variety of ways. Um, you know, let's uh, switch up the pen now. Let's use a blue one. So let's see, I'll keep using my left because I like what's happening. All right, let's indicate your mouth. If you could only, uh, hopefully it translates on camera how awkward it is using this left hand because it's, it's painful. And yet, I, I, as an artist, I'm, I, I tend to be very, very um, anal with my work. So this kind of drawing would be really impossible for me to do with, with my proper hand because I would kept trying to correct, like autocorrect. Uh, and that's not an opportunity when using uh, left. So that's why I said it's a, it's a good thing to sometimes switch up your practice a little bit. Okay, we've got some um, ink wash here, which is just ink diluted with water. And let's uh, add a little bit of that. Boom. Okay, let's add a little bit in here. For those of you that are um, looking for something to kind of catch up in terms of reading, uh, Katie Kovitz, absolutely an amazing artist with an absolutely amazing uh, life story. And I would highly encourage you to, uh, if, you're, if that's uh, of interest to you, to um, look into it, it's just fascinating. Um, Okay, and then just to kind of keep it all exciting, let's add a little bit, of, um, just a little bit of variety. So we'll add a little bit of coffee right there. Just kind of spice things up a little bit, keep it all. And now there's the other dog. All right. That and oh, I'll keep it there for now. Um, so we got about a few more minutes. I wanted to see if perhaps there might be any questions any of you have, anything I might be able to answer for you. I'll give it a second for this to dry, and then we'll put the final cap on uh, a final line on this drawing. But I just want to give it a minute or two for it to dry. Um, are there any questions? No. No. I see any chat here, but okay. I have one um, just to kind of get us started. How do yep. you decide what um, marks to assign a line to or to assign, you know, as you're filling in where the darks are? At what point would you say, you know, the contrast isn't dark enough, if that makes sense? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so like for example, like oh, yeah, that's like, still, like gray, so it should be on it's darker, on, on. but it wasn't white. Yeah, I, yeah. Squinting. I, I, I had a professor uh, who who was who was absolutely terrific, and she is world renowned portraitist. And I remember she always said, like squint. Squinting is your best friend because squinting it really gets rid of all that information that's superfluous that you don't need. You know, you look at a person and you're looking directly at them and you see every 
line in their forehead, you see every eyebrow, you see every single hair in their chin. But if you squint, you really can't see any of that. You, you see our general shapes, you see the light and the dark. And that's really the best way to kind of succinctly kind of try to capture that information before you get down this rabbit hole of just too much information. Um, it's, you know, it's like with music, like, yeah, it can be really, really complex, but if it's a, if it's a tune, a melody that you can kind of whistle, that's why Beatles were so incredible, right? Because everybody can whistle their stuff and yet they're also very complex. And that's really what you want to find that nice kind of blend of like, yes, this, this line right here gives me a, 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 a strip of white shape that's going to help this face kind of have a round sensation, right? So just by simply adding those lines, uh, by doing exercises, you know, just doing a ton, ton of these, uh, we just get better at it. And, and it's one of those things to, to know that you can always keep improving your practice. So uh, I, I still, to this day, continue doing uh, like little portrait studies, little sketches every single day. It's just to kind of continue working that motion between you know, your brain and your hand that they communicate to each other, like where you want the line to go, actually the line goes there. Um, but I would say that the best way to get there is by, by doing the squinting. All right, thank you. Of course. Um, so far, just a, one comment in the chat. Just people have really enjoyed watching you work and watching your videos and sharing in your technique. And Randy asks, what was the medium used for the first color demo? Oh, for the first color demo, that was a um, prime, um, was a acrylic and with a little bit of gouache. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, gouache is opaque water, uh, opaque watercolor. So. The difference between uh, gouache and regular watercolor is that when you overlay watercolor, you will see the bottom layer because it's transparent, right? So if you added yellow and then you put blue on it, you're not going to have blue. You're going to have green because those two are going to blend together. If you're working in, in gouache or acrylic, they're, they are opaque, so they're going to cover. The, the top layer will cover the bottom layer. So yellow and blue won't give you green. It will give you blue. Um, and that's what we was used in that color demo. It was a combination of um, acrylic because it covers. But then I often like to use um, uh, gouache because it gives you that kind of chunkiness, almost like... Um, skin you know it's not smooth but it kind of has these little particles in it so it, it translates nicely when you are trying to create a sensation of um, something that has here let me see if i can find some. also for example in this if i get close enough you'll kind of start seeing these uh the camera picks up on it you'll see it kind of has a scent right there you see those imperfections kind of they feel much more natural and they kind of feel like skin. So it kind of adds almost like a sculptural feel to it. So yes, uh, gouache and watercolor. Uh, I mean, gouache and acrylic, sorry. <laughs> well, and then David asks, what's the process for going from the sketch pad to the larger canvas painting? That's, that's, a, good, uh, that's a great question. What I do is I usually use um, sketches for um, when, when it's like studies or um, sketch books and sketch pads, when it's studies or, or um, you know, uh, sketches, because I'm not very precious with these, I, I, I'm willing to kind of draw over them and mess them up and do all sorts of stuff and experiment with it and put, you know, um, uh, wax on it to kind of create different textures. Uh, canvas, I usually reserve for when I'm actually working on a specific piece. Um, so it's also on a paper how it responds to, to uh, the, the, the medium itself. So acrylic, really, it's much smoother on a paper and you, it can get really kind of nice and thick versus on a canvas because it's not a smooth surface. It has texture to it. You know, it, it'll have that sensation of not being completely... Um, smooth 
like for example this right if you you can see the the little bumps of the canvas uh, so usually the canvases um, for me are when, when I'm working on a piece that I very rarely use canvases for studies or sketches. That's where I, I do, I do those on paper. And also because I can experiment like on this one, you can see that there was actually some marker, uh, just a regular marker before I went over with acrylic, which you really couldn't do that kind of playing around on, on canvas because it's more of a traditional approach and, you know, can't, markers new run, not really going to show on, on, on canvas. Yeah. And then Doug asks, um, Doug would like to know a little bit more about how you choose colors for expressionistic portraits. Uh, I noticed that you exaggerated the reds in one portrait, perhaps to highlight the blood in the face, or do you have any other tips you might give for how to choose what colors to exaggerate or change? I, I, I'm going to be completely honest with you, which uh, it, it may <laughs> be this is recorded, but I'm really bad at color. color each, each artist kind of has like their forte, I think. And to me, color is something I struggle with very, very much. It does not come to me naturally. I have to really kind of play around and experiment with different um, hues and qualities. I'm not one of those people that, you know, are going to give me three colors and I'm going to come up with the most amazing combinations. I just can't do it. So I kind of tend to experiment a lot. And even for example, the one I just had up, which is this one, it might have ended ultimately as a red background, but if I remember correctly, there were like four different colors before I got to the red. And it was just once I saw it, I was like, oh, it works. But it was like, you know, this mustard yellow before and I didn't care for it then it moved to something else I didn't care for that so I, I think that if if you I, I would say as a as a as a maybe you begin to kind of get into it I would get some art books and see what artists that speak to you you know who are the artists that kind of grab your attention is it uh, Marlene Dumas is it Philip Guston for example Philip Guston is known for having a very exquisite kind of color palette and when I think of these pinks and kind of really kind of flesh tones and certain grays I think of Philip Guston so uh you know it re I would say that's the best way to determine colors is just kind of look at the artwork you like of the artists that you like and think like what are the palettes here that work but as as a, as a side note as something that could be helpful limiting your palette is probably one of the best ways to kind of get started and limiting your palette means that instead of having every color under the sun at your disposal limit yourself to only two or three colors and say i'm only going to work with uh blue orange and something else right and then it it, it may sound counterintuitive like oh how much can i really accomplish with just three colors but actually by limiting yourself, you free yourself from not having to worry about the colors themselves. You can really focus on other things and then leave the colors for sort of the last uh, thing. Uh, Al Albers uh, is another great source for colors and color theory if that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Um, and then Randy asks, this is probably our last question, um, is do you have a preference type of paper, and I'm, I'm going to probably butcher this word, when using um, gouache? Yeah, gouache. Or for watercolor paper, and then also sure. for general sketching. So just paper types. That's, that's, that's great. I, I, I've, I've found this specific brand, Can, uh, Canson brand, uh, a while back, and this is a mixed media um, uh, paper, so which means that it's not too heavy but it's heavy enough that it accommodates both wet and dry media, which is what, what I like to experiment with. And you can tell like often when you buy paper or, uh, or notebooks, it'll tell you the poundage, right? And so this one is a 98 pound, which means that it's, it's a thicker, more dense paper. Uh, so you can really put watercolor on here or you can put really, really thick um, acrylic and it will equally handle that, that uh, medium. 
And you can see by like the stiffness of the paper, that's really what I like the most is that it's really, really stiff. So I can add whatever my fancy is onto it and it just handles itself really wonderfully. So that would probably, that's, that's the one that I keep buying is, you know, there's other, there's Bristol boards, which are much smoother and softer, but they're not really that great for wet medium because because of that smoothness, the, the water, instead of pooling, it tends to kind of slide off. So it doesn't really retain any of these beautiful elements that occur when the so, some of that moisture gets absorbed, right? Um, yeah, that's right here. That's the one I use. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you're seeing some of these um, messages coming through in the chat. Everyone's had a wonderful time. Oh, and so for those who- you, yeah, for those who maybe this is your first session, we have three three or four other recorded sessions with Miha, um, an art theory, uh, por history of the portrait recording, um, and then a few other art classes like comics and sketching, and we definitely recommend you check those out on our YouTube. Um, I could definitely send those out when I also send out the recording from this session, so if you want to rewatch or share with family and friends. Um, thank you, you know, just it's been wonderful to get to know you and learn more about your work the last few months, um, and just for those who are still on with us, we were talking earlier, we'd love to have Miha back in the fall. So with that, I'm gonna let everyone um, have a great rest of your afternoon. Um, and thanks again.